Hello students, welcome to the Contemporary World Subject. In today's discussion, we are going to discuss the last chapter of our prelim coverage, the Global Interstate System. So without further ado, let's get started. So the Global Interstate System, it is the whole system of human interactions. The modern world system is structured politically as an interstate system, a system of competing and allying states. Political scientists commonly call this the international system and this is the focal point of the field of international relations. Alright, so this explains the effort of different countries and governments all over the world to have cooperation and collaboration. Example nito, yung IMF natin or yung International Monetary Fund and the World Bank as well or yung WB. So from the word itself, interstate, when we say interstate, it is the relation of each state. When we say inter kasi, it has something to do with the relationship with each other. Kapag sinabi naman natin global, it's the relationship of countries globally around the world. Kapag sinabi naman nating system, meron tayong sinusunod na sistema, step-by-step -step process. Ano yung proseso na yun? Of course, to attain a certain economic political, environmental, and social goals. Kaya ang Philippines, meron din tayong sinusunod na batas, mga alintuntunin when it comes to its international engagement with other countries. For example, pagdating sa international trading ng Philippines sa ibang countries, merong batas na sinusunod. Pagdating sa international market, meron ding sinusunod na batas. So, dito, okay, meron tayong policies na dapat sundin. Okay. So, world systems are defined by the existence of a division of labor. The modern world system has a multi-state political structure and therefore its division of labor is international division of labor. The division of labor consists of three zones according to the prevalence of profitable industries or activities. We have the core, the semi-periphery, and the periphery. What does it mean by modern world system? As you can see on this map, the countries are colored on three different colors. You can see the yellow, you can see the green, and the orange. This is what we call the modern world system, where the world is divided based on their capital or wealth. So, nakadepende sa kung gaano kayaman ang isang bansa. Yun yung basis sa division dito sa may uh, modern world system, yung core, semi-periphery, and periphery. Okay? So, there are three divisions of labor. As I have mentioned to you a while ago, we have the core, the semi-periphery, and the periphery. First is the core. What is core? So, these are high-income nations in the world economy. Sila yung may mga matataas nakita matataas ang sinasahod ng kanilang mga laborers sa bansang ito. So, this is the manufacturing base of the planet where resources funnel in to become the technology and wealth enjoyed by the Western world today. These core are dominant capitalists that exploit peripheral countries for labor and raw materials. So when we say exploit, tinitake advantage nila yung labor and raw materials ng peripheral countries. So basically speaking, yung core ang nakikinabang dun sa labor and raw materials ng mga peripheral countries. What about the semi-periphery? So semi-periphery, these are the middle income countries such as India and Brazil. These are considered semi-periphery due to their closer ties to the global economic core. So peripheral countries share characteristics of both core and peripheral countries. So basically speaking, my dear students, they are at the middle. Okay, nasa average level ang semi-periphery. Yung characteristics na meron ang core at ang periphery, meron kay semi-periphery. Okay? And then the last one, we have the periphery, also called as the low-income countries. Okay, sila naman yung mga bansa na may mabababang kita lang. Okay, yung mga manggagawa nila. Whose natural resources or labor support the wealthier countries. First as colonists and now by working for multinational corporations under neocolonialism. Okay, so could you imagine, sila pa yung nagsusupport dun sa mga wealthier countries as sila na nga tong mga hindi pa ganun ka-develop na bansa. Peripheral countries are dependent on core countries for capital and have underdeveloped industry. So basically, sila yung mga bansa na hindi ganun kataas yung kanilang status. Okay, medyo may hirap na bansa ito at nakadepende sila sa core countries. 
So, paano nagmo-move yung resources? Resources are redistributed from the underdeveloped country to developed countries. So, from periphery papunta sa core. Okay? Cyclical rhythms represent the short-term fluctuation of economy. Okay? Take note of that. Cyclical rhythms. While secular trends mean deeper long-run tendencies such as general economic growth or decline. So, we have cyclical rhythms and secular trends. The term contradiction means a general controversy in the system, usually concerning some short-term versus long-term trade-offs. The last temporal feature is the crisis. So, crisis occurs if a constellation of circumstances brings about the end of the system. The world system theory stresses that the world systems should be the basic unit of social analysis. What do we mean by this? We should focus not on individual states but on the relations between their groupings, the core, the semi-periphery, and the periphery. Okay, so here is the theory model of Emmanuel Waller-Steins at World System. So according to him, the world economic system is divided into three. And as I have mentioned a while ago, it's the core, the semi-periphery, and periphery. Take a look at the arrow and you will understand its meaning. But let me elaborate this one. Core countries like US, Japan, and Germany are dominant capitalist countries characterized by high levels of industrialization and urbanization. So as you can see on the description, the core countries, high profit consumption goods. Nasabi nga natin kanina na ang mga periphery countries nakadepende lagi kay core. So, core countries are capital intensive and they have high wages and high technology production patterns and lower amounts of labor exploitation and coercion. Next one, we have the semi-periphery. So, countries like South Korea, Taiwan, Mexico, Brazil, India, Nigeria, South Africa are less developed than the core countries. But they are more developed than peripheral countries. Nagigets ba? So, they are the buffer between core and peripheral countries. And then, for the peripheral countries which includes some African countries and low-income countries in South America are dependent on core countries for capital and they are less industrialized and urbanized. So that is the explanation of Wallerstein World System Theory Model. Okay, tanong, saan kabilang ang Philippines? Sa core, semi-periphery, or periphery? What do you think? Mm-hmm. Okay, to answer this question, Philippines belongs to semi-periphery, okay? Tayo ay developing country pa lang, okay? Hindi pa tayo develop, hindi rin tayo underdevelop. So, nasa gitna tayo, okay? Moving on to the global governance. So, what do we mean by global governance? Global governance is sometimes referred to as world governance. Global is a movement towards political cooperation among transnational actors negotiating responses to problems that affect more than one state or region. Global governance may mean the process of designating laws, rules, or regulations intended for a global scale. Sa madaling sabi, ang global governance, my dear students, ina-address dito yung bang mga worldwide problems ng bawat bansa na tipo bang hindi na kayang maresolbahan ng isang bansa lang. And para maresolba ito, kailangan ng bawat bansa ng approach wherein sama-sama sila because one country cannot do it alone because the problem itself is borderless or wala ng hangganan. Okay? Take note, the goal of global governance is to provide global public goods, particularly peace and security, justice and mediation systems for conflict, functioning markets, and unified standards for trade and industry. Next one, we have the effects of global governance. So, what are the effects of global governance? Globalization restrains governments by inducing increased budgetary pressure. So, when we say budgetary pressure, these are unavoidable consequence of allocating scarce resources. Okay? Yung kakulangan sa resources. Okay? And because of this, there is a possibility that the governments may attempt to curtail or ilasen the budget for the welfare state, which is often seen as a drag on international competitiveness by reducing especially their expenditures on transfers and subsidies. 
Moving on to internationalism versus globalization, internationalization refers to the increasing importance of international trade, international relations, treaties, alliances, and many more. When we say international, my dear students, it means between or among nations. The basic unit remains the nation even as relations among nations become increasingly necessary and important. What is nation in simple words? A nation is a group of people who share the same culture, history, language, or ethnicity. It can also be described as people living in the same country and having a government. Is Philippines a nation? Yes, definitely. Okay, Philippines is also a nation because we have culture, we have history, we have language, we have ethnicity, and we live in the same country and we have a government. Okay? On the other hand, we have globalization. I believe you are now familiar with this term since we discussed this in the previous chapter. So, globalization refers to the global economic integration of many formerly national economies into one global economy, mainly by free trade and free capital mobility, but also by easy or uncontrolled migration. It is the effective erasure of national boundaries for economic purposes. International trade governed by comparative advantage becomes interregional trade governed by absolute advantage. So, what's the difference between comparative advantage and absolute advantage? So, na-discuss ko sa inyo last time yung comparative advantage ni David Ricardo. So, when we say absolute advantage, okay, absolute advantage muna tayo, it refers to the ability of a certain country to produce more or better goods and services than somebody else. On the other hand, comparative advantage refers to the ability of a country to produce goods and services at a lower opportunity cost, not necessarily at a greater volume or quality. Okay, so para hindi kayo malito, when we say absolute advantage, okay, ang isang bansa nakakapag-produce siya ng isang product na mas better yung quality as compared to other countries. Kung baga, lamang siya. And kapag sinabi naman natin comparative advantage, nakakapag-produce ang isang bansa ng goods and services na mura lang yung capital as compared dun sa ibang bansa na medyo malaki yung gastos nila sa raw materials. Okay? Moving on to the last slide. The national community embraced both national labor and national capital, and these classes cooperated to produce national goods largely with national natural resources. Ngayon, yung mga national goods na na-produce, nilalaban yan or in-offer yan sa international markets against dun sa goods and services na in-offer din ng ibang bansa. Okay, so basically, this is the internationalization as defined a while ago. Okay, so that explains our lecture for Chapter 3, The Global Governance. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good day ahead. Goodbye, everyone.